Hey there, this is Jesse Johnson again. It's uh, been a little bit since I've read, uh, but I'm looking forward to getting back in the swing of it. Uh, as before, we're reading Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Um, so last time that we read, uh, our two main characters, Axel and his uncle Otto, um, had just found a little clue as far as a potential geological discovery uh, hidden in a very old book uh, and transcribed into a certain code which they were able to decipher. And now they are, um, where we left off, they were just arguing about the uh, potential authority and the um, authenticity of this uh, particular little message here. Um, so I'm just going to pick up partway through uh, chapter six, and then we'll just go on from there. Um, starting just before I left off, the conversation went something like this. Oh, but you can prove anything with figures. But it's the same with facts. Is it not known that the number of volcanoes has decreased since the first days of creation? And if there is central heat, may we not therefore conclude that it too is decreasing? My dear uncle, if you're entering the realms of speculation, there's nothing more to be said. But I have to tell you that the greatest names have come round to supporting my view. Do you remember a visit paid to me by the celebrated chemist Humphrey Davy in 1825? Not at all, since I wasn't born until 19 years after that. Well, Humphrey Davy did call on me on this way through Hamburg. We spent a long time discussing, amongst other problems, the hypothesis of the liquid structure of the nucleus of the Earth. We agreed that it couldn't be in a liquid state, for a reason which science has never been able to confute. What is the reason? I said, rather astonished. Because this liquid mass would be subject, like the ocean, to lunar attraction, and therefore, twice every day, there would be internal tides which, by pushing up on the terrestrial crust, would cause regular earthquakes. Yes, it's evident that the surface of the globe has been the subject to the action of fire, I replied, and it is quite reasonable to suppose that the external crust cooled down first, whilst the heat took refuge down at the center. You'd be wrong in that assumption, replied my uncle. The earth has been heated by combustion on its surface, and that's all. Its surface was composed of a great many metals, such as potassium and sodium, which have uh, the peculiar property of igniting when they come into contact with air and water. These metals ignited when the atmospheric vapor fell on the ground as rain, and by and by, when the water penetrated into the fissures of the crust of the earth, it caused fresh combustion with explosions and eruptions. This was what caused the numerous volcanoes when the earth was formed. That is a very clever hypothesis, I exclaimed, somewhat in spite of myself. And one which Humphrey Davy demonstrated to me by a simple experiment. He formed a small ball of the metals I have mentioned, making a very fair representation of our globe. Whenever he caused a fine spray of rain to fall on the surface, it swelled up, oxidized, and formed tiny mountains. A crater broke open at one of its summits, an eruption took place, and transmitted such heat to the whole of the ball that it could not be held in one's hand. In truth, I was beginning to be swayed by the professor's arguments, to which he was giving additional weight by his usual ardor and fervent enthusiasm. You see, Axel, he added, the state of the nucleus of the earth has given rise to various hypotheses among geologists. There is no proof at all of this internal heat, and my opinion is that there is no such thing that there cannot be such a thing. In any case, we shall see for ourselves, and, like Arnie Sagnusum, we'll know exactly what the truth is concerning this important question. Very well, we shall see, I replied, carried away by his contagious enthusiasm. Yes, we shall see. That is, if it's possible to see anything there. And why not? May we not depend on electrical phenomena to give us light? May we not even expect light from the atmosphere, the presence of which may cause it to be luminous as we near the center? Well, yes, I said. That too is possible. It is certain, exclaimed my uncle in a tone of triumph. But not a word, do you hear? Not a word about this whole subject. We don't want anyone to get the idea of discovering the center of the earth before we do. Chapter 7. A Woman's Courage so ended this memorable session. 
That conversation threw me into a fever. I came out of my uncle's study quite stunned, so much so that it was as if there was not enough air in all the streets of Hamburg to put me right again. I therefore made for the banks of the Elbe, close to the quay for the streamer that piles through the town and the Hamburg railway line. Was I convinced of the truth of what I had heard? Had I not simply given way under the pressure of Professor Lindenbrock's forceful personality? Was I to believe that he was really in earnest in his intention to penetrate to the center of this massive globe? Had I been listening to the mad speculations of a lunatic or to the scientific conclusions of a lofty genius? Where did truth end? Where did error begin? I was all adrift amongst a thousand contradictory hypotheses, and I couldn't grasp any one of them firmly. But I remembered that I had been convinced, although my enthusiasm was now beginning to cool. I felt a desire to make a start at once, and not to lose time and courage by calm reflection. I had at that moment quite enough courage to simply pack my case and set off. But I have to confess that in another hour this unusual excitement abated, my nervous tension lessened, and from the depths of the earth I climbed back to the surface again. It's absolutely crazy, I shouted out. There's no sense in it. No sensible young man should consider such a proposal for a moment. Nothing of that is real. I've had a bad night. It's all a bad dream. By this time, I had walked along the banks of the Elba and crossed the town. After passing the port as well, I reached the Altona Road. Something led me there, some intuition that was soon to be justified, for I shortly caught sight of my little Graben returning with her light step to Hamburg. Graben! I shouted, while still some way away. The young girl stopped, rather frightened, perhaps, to hear someone call her name on the public highway. In ten strides, I was behind her. Axel! she claimed and exclaimed in surprise. What, then? Have you come to meet me? Is that why you're here? But when she looked at me, Graben couldn't fail to see my uneasiness and distress. What's the matter with you? she said, holding out her hand. What's the matter with me, Graben? You have no idea, I said. In two seconds and three sentences, my pretty Verland girl was fully informed of what was going on. For the time, she was silent. Was her heart beating like mine? I don't know, but I do know that her hand wasn't trembling in mine. We walked on a hundred yards without speaking. At last, she said, Axel, my darling Graben. That will be a wonderful journey. These words made me jump. Yes, Axel, it's a journey worthy of the nephew of a scientist. It's a good thing for a man to gain fame by some great undertaking. What, Graben? Aren't you going to try to dissuade me from setting out on such an expedition? No, my dear Axel, and I would willingly go with you, except that a poor girl would only be in your way. Are you serious? Quite serious. Oh, women, girls, the female mind, how hard it is to understand you. When you're not the most timid of creatures, you're the bravest. Reason has no influence over you. What was she saying? Was this child encouraging me to undertake such an expedition? Would she really not be afraid to take part in it herself? And she was urging me to do it. Me, the one she loved. I was disconcerted, and, to tell you the truth, I was ashamed. We'll see whether you say the same thing tomorrow, Graben. Tomorrow, my dear Axel, I will say exactly what I have said today. Graben and I continued on our way, hand in hand, but in silence. The emotional turmoil of the day had exhausted me. After all, I thought, the calends of July are a long way off, and between now and then many things could happen that would cure my uncle of his desire to travel underground. It was night when we arrived at the house in the Konigstrasse. I expected to find the house quiet, my uncle in bed as usual and Martha giving the dining room a last touch with the feather duster. But I hadn't taken into account the professor's impatience. I found him shouting and getting himself all worked up amidst a crowd of porters who were all depositing various loads in the hallway. Our old servant was at her wit's end. Come on, Axel, you miserable wretch, shouted my uncle as soon as he saw me. Your cases aren't packed and my papers aren't in order. I can't find the key of my carpet bag, and I haven't got my gaiters. I stood thunderstruck. My voice failed. My lips could scarcely utter the words. 
Are we really going? Of course we are. I never dreamed that you would go out for a walk instead of getting a move on with your preparations. So we're really going? I asked again, my hopes fading. Yes, the day after tomorrow, early. I couldn't listen to any more. I fled to my room for refuge. All hope was now gone. Michael had spent the whole afternoon buying some of the tools and apparatus required for this desperate undertaking. The hallway was packed with rope ladders, knotted cords, torches, flasks, grappling irons, alpenstocks, pickaxes, iron-tipped sticks, enough for ten men to carry. I spent a terrible night. Next morning I was called early. I had quite decided not to open the door. But how, to, how could I resist the sweet voice which was always music to my ears, saying, Axel, dear! I came out of my room. I thought my pale countenance and my red and sleepless eyes would have some effect on Grabin's sympathies and change her mind. Oh, Axel, my dear, she said. I see you're better. A night's rest has done you good. Done me good? I exclaimed. I rushed to the mirror. Well, in fact, I did look better than I'd expected. I could hardly believe my own eyes. Axel, she said. I've had a long talk with my guardian. He's a dedicated scientist and a man of immense courage, and you must remember that his blood flows in your veins. He has told me of his plans and his hopes, and why and how he hopes to attain his objective. I have no doubt he will succeed. My dear Axel, it's a wonderful thing to devote yourself to science. What honor is await Professor Lidenbrock, and they will reflect on his companion too. When you return, Axel, you will be a man, his equal, free to speak and to act independently, and free to... The dear girl had, could only finish this sentence with a blush. Her words revived me. But I refused to believe we would be starting so soon. I dragged Robin into the professor's study. Uncle, is it true we're going? Why do you doubt it? Well, I'm not doubting it, I said, not wanting to annoy him. But what need is there for all this hurry? Time. Time that is flying by with a speed that nothing can change. But it's only the 16th of May, and the end of June is- You ignoramus! Do you think you can get to Iceland in a couple of days? If you hadn't gone off and left me like a fool, I would have taken you to the office of Liffender and Company of Copenhagen, and then you would have learned that there's only one sailing every month from Copenhagen to Reykjavik on the 22nd. Well? Well? If we waited for the 22nd of June, We'd be too late to see the shadow of Skarmis touch the crater of Snaefell. So, we must get to Copenhagen as fast as we can in order to secure our package. Go and pack! There was nothing I could say to this. I went to my room. Graben followed me. She set to pack everything I would need on my trip. She was no more affected than I had been, starting out on a little trip to Lubeck, or Heliogaland. Her little hands moved without haste. She talked quietly. She kept giving me sensible reasons for our expedition. She charmed me, and yet I was angry with her. Now and then, I felt like exploding into a temper. But she took no notice, and went on as methodol <laughs> methodically as ever. Finally, the last strap was buckled. I went downstairs again. All that day, the suppliers of scientific instruments, guns, and electrical equipment kept coming and going. Martha was being driven distracted. Is the professor mad? she asked. I nodded my head. And is he going to take you with him? I nodded again. Where to? I pointed down towards the floor. Down into the cellar! exclaimed the old servant. No, I said. Lower than that. Night came, but I didn't notice time passing. Tomorrow morning at six o'clock sharp, said my uncle. That's when we're setting off. At ten o'clock, I fell on my bed, a mere lump of inert matter. All through the night, terror gripped me. I dreamed of abysses. I was a prey to delirium. I felt myself held by the professor's sinewy hand, dragged along, hurled down, shattered into little bits. I dropped down unfathomable precipices with the accelerating velocity of bodies falling through space. My life became one unending fall. I awoke at five, trembling and weary, with my nerves shattered. I went downstairs. My uncle was already at the table, gobbling down his breakfast. 
I stared at him with horror and disgust. But my dear Grobin was there, so I said nothing. But I couldn't eat a thing. At half past five, there was a rattle of wheels outside. A large carriage had arrived to take us to Altona Railway Station. It was soon piled up with my uncle's trunks and cases. Where's your case? he cried. It's ready, I replied in a faltering voice. Then hurry up and bring it down, or I'll miss the train. It was now clearly impossible to continue to struggle against fate. I went up to my room again and let my case slide down the stairs, following quickly after it. At that moment, my uncle was solemnly handing over control of the household to Graben. My pretty Verlin girl was as calm and collected as ever. She kissed her garden, but couldn't hold back a tear as she touched my cheek with her gentle lips. Graben, I murmured. Go, my dear Axel, go. I'm your fiancé now, and when you come back, I will be your wife. I hugged her in my arms and took my seat in the carriage. Martha and the young girl standing at the door waved their last farewell. Then the horses, urged on by the driver's whistling, swept off at a gallop on the road to Altona. Chapter 8. Serious Preparations for a Vertical Descent Altona, which is just a hot suburb of Hamburg, is in the terminus of the Kiel Railway, which was to take us to the coast at the Belts. In 20 minutes, we were at Holstein. At half past six, the carriage stopped outside the station. My uncle's numerous voluminous trunks were unloaded, moved, labeled, and weighed, and put into luggage vans, and at seven, we were seated face to face in our compartment. The whistle blew, and the engine pulled away. We were off. Was I resigned to my fate? No, not yet. Nevertheless, the cool morning air and the rapidly changing scenes along the way, to some extent, drew me out of my sad thoughts. As for the professor's thoughts, they were running far ahead of the express train. We were alone in the carriage, but we sat in silence. My uncle checked all his pockets and his traveling bag with the minutest care. I could see that he hadn't overlooked the slightest detail. Amongst other documents, there was a carefully folded sheet of paper bearing the heading of the Danish consulate and signed by Mr. Christensen, the Danish consul in Hamburg, and a friend of the professor's. This, we would hope, would provide us with the means in Copenhagen of getting a recommendation to the governor of Iceland. I also caught sight of the famous document, carefully hidden in a secret pocket in my uncle's wallet. I cursed it and then began to study the countryside. It was an interminable succession of uninteresting loamy and fertile flats, a very easy country to build railways on, and particularly suitable for the laying down of these direct level lines so dear to railway companies. I had no time to get tired of the monotony, for in three hours we stopped at Kiel, close to the sea. The luggage being labeled for Copenhagen, we had no need to concern ourselves with it, but nonetheless the professor kept a careful eye on every item until all were safe on board. Then they disappeared into the hold. My uncle, in his haste, had so well calculated the connection times between the train and the steamer that we had a whole day to spare. The steamer Eleonora was not leaving until that night. This caused nine hours of feverish overexcitement in which the impatient, irascible traver, traveler, my uncle, consigned to hell the railway directors and the steamboat companies and the governments which allowed such intolerable delays. I was forced to back him up when he argued with the captain of the Eleonora on this very subject. He had wanted to get him to stoke the boilers at once. The captain told him to clear off. In Kiel, as elsewhere, a day passes eventually. What with walking along the verdant shores of the bay on which the little town stands, exploring the thick woods which make the town look like a nest hidden in a triangle of branches, admiring the villas, each with its own little bathhouse, and by rushing about and grumbling, at last ten o'clock came. The smoke from the Eleonora's funnel rose up into the sky in thick curls, and the bridge shook with the throbbing of the boiler. We were on board, and for a time possessors of two berths, one above the other, in the only saloon cabin on the ship. At a quarter past ten, the ship cast off and started on its journey over the dark waters of the Great Belt. 
The night was dark. There was a sharp breeze and a rough sea. Through the thick darkness, a few lights appeared on the shore. Later on, I don't know when, a dazzling light from some lighthouse threw a bright stream of fire across the waves. And this is all I can remember of the first crossing of ours. At seven in the morning, we landed at Kosor, a small town on the west coast of Zealand. There, we transferred from the boat to another railway line, which took us across the country every bit as flat as Holstein. Three hours traveling brought us to the capital of Denmark. My uncle hadn't shut his eyes all night. In his impatience, I do believe we had been trying to make the train go faster with his feet. At last, he caught a glimpse of the sea. The sound, he shouted. On our left was a huge building that looked like a hospital. That's a lunatic asylum, said one of our traveling companions. Great, I thought. Just a place, just the place to end our days in. But big as it is, that asylum isn't big enough to hold the complete madness of Professor Lidenbrock. At ten in the morning, we at last set foot in Copenhagen. The luggage was loaded onto a carriage and, with us two, taken to the Phoenix Hotel in Breda Street. This took half an hour, because the station is outside the town. Then my uncle, after a quick wash, dragged me after him. The porter at the hotel could speak German and English, but the professor, as a polyglot, questioned him in good Danish. And it was in the same language that we were given directions to the Museum of Northern Antiquities. The museum was a curious establishment, a collection of wonders, stone weapons, metal goblets, and jewelry, by means of which one might reconstruct the ancient history of the country. Professor Thompson, the curator, was a learned scholar and a friend of the Danish consul in Hamburg. My uncle had a cordial letter of introduction to him. As a general rule, one scholar greets another with a certain coolness, but here it was different. Professor Thompson greeted Professor Lindenbrock warmly, like an old friend, and the professor's nephew as well. I need hardly say that we kept our secret from the worthy curator. We were simply visiting Iceland out of harmless curiosity. Professor Thompson put himself entirely at our disposal, and with him we visited the harbor with the object of finding the vessel that was due to sail the soonest. I was still hoping there would be no way of getting to Iceland, but no such luck. A small Danish schooner, the Valkyrie, was set to sail for Reykjavik on the 2nd of June. The captain, a Mr. Bjarne, was on board. His passenger-to-be was so overjoyed that he shook his hand so hard he almost broke it. The worthy fellow was rather surprised at the intensity. To him, it seemed a very simple thing to go to Iceland, as that was his business, but to my uncle it was sublime. The worthy captain took advantage of this enthusiasm to charge us double for the trip, but we didn't bother ourselves over such trifles. He must be on board on Tuesday at seven in the morning, said Captain Bjarne, having pocketed the cash. Then we thanked Professor Thompson for his kindness and returned to the Phoenix Hotel. That's fine, that's fine, my uncle kept saying. How lucky we are to have found this boat ready to sail. Now, let's have some breakfast and wander around the town. First, we went to the Koenig's Rennai Tower, an irregularly shaped square in which there are two innocent-looking guns which should wouldn't frighten anyone. Close by, at number five, there was a French restaurant owned by a chef by the name of Vincent, where we got an ample breakfast that cost us four marks each. Then I took childish pleasure in exploring the city. My uncle let me drag him around with me, but he took no notice of anything, not the insignificant king's palace, nor the pretty 17th century bridge which spans a canal in front of the museum, nor that immense monument to Thorwaldsen, decorated with a horrible mural painting and containing within a collection of the sculptor's works. Nor, in a beautiful park, the chocolate box Rosenberg Café, nor the beautiful Renaissance edifice of the Exchange, nor its spire composed of the twisted rails of four bronze dragons, nor the huge windmill on the ramparts, whose huge arms billowed in the sea breeze like the sails of a ship. What delightful walks we would have had to together, my pretty Verlin girl and I, along the harbor where the double deck ships and the frigates slept peacefully beside the red roofs of the warehouses, by the green banks along the strait, through the deep shades of the trees amongst which the fort is half concealed. 
where the guns are thrusting at their black throats between branches of alder and willow. But alas, Graben was far away, and I had no hope of ever seeing her again. But, if my uncle felt no attraction to these romantic scenes, he was very much struck by the sight of a certain church spire situated on the island of Amager, which forms the southwest part of Copenhagen. I was ordered to head in that direction. We embarked on a small steamer, which piles the canals, and in a few minutes it pulled alongside the dockyard quay. After making our way through a few narrow streets where some convicts in yellow and grey trousers were at work under the supervision of warders, we arrived at the Vor Felker's Kirk. There was nothing remarkable about the church, but there was a reason why its tall spire had attracted the professor's attention. Starting from the top of the tower, an external staircase wound around the spire, circling upwards in spirals. Let's go right to the top, said my uncle. I'll get dizzy, I said. All the more reason why we should go up. We've got to get used to it. But come on, I tell you. Don't waste time. I had no option but to obey. A caretaker who lived at the other end of the street gave us the key, and our ascent began. My uncle went ahead, treading carefully. I followed him rather anxiously, because I was very prone to dizziness. I had neither the sense of balance of an eagle, nor the nerves of one. As long as we were protected by being on the inside of the winding staircase of the tower, all went well enough, but after we had toiled up a hundred and fifty steps, fresh air hit me in the face, and we found ourselves on the platform at the top of the tower. There, the outside staircase began its spirals, protected only by a thin iron rail, and the narrowing steps seemed to lead on up into infinite space. I'll never be able to do it, I said. Come on, don't be a card said my uncle, not showing a shred of pity. I had no option but to follow him, clutching at every step. The cold air made me giddy. I felt the spire rocking with every gust of wind. My legs were turning to jelly. Soon I was crawling on my knees, then on my stomach. I closed my eyes. I seemed to be lost in space. As I reached the top, assisted by my uncle dragging me up by the collar. Look down, he cried. Take a good look down. You must have a lesson in abysses. I opened my eyes. I saw houses squashed flat as if they had all fallen from the sky. They seemed to be drowning in a smoky fog. Above my head, ragged clouds were drifting past, and by an optical illusion they seemed stationary, while the steeple, the ball, and I were all scudding along at a fantastic speed. Far away to one side was green countryside, while on the other, the sea sparkled, bathed in sunlight. The sound stretched away to Elsinore, dotted with a few white sails like seagulls' wings. And in the misty east, and away to the northeast, lay outstretched the faintly shadowed shores of Sweden. All this immensity of space whirled and swirled before my eyes. But I was forced to get back up, to stand up, to look. My first lesson in dizziness lasted an hour. When I got permission to come down and feel the solid street pavements beneath my feet, I was aching all over. We'll do the same again tomorrow, said the professor. And so it was. For five days in a row, I was made to undergo this anti-vertigo exercise, and whether I wanted to or not, I made definite progress in the art of looking down from high places. So the next chapter is Iceland, but what next? Chapter 9. Um, but with that, I think we're going to call it a session for the day. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, and hopefully you'll be joining me again soon for the uh, next leg of the journey. Be seeing you around.